I'm going to share a word with you. I'm excited about sharing this. I believe there's a prophetic season attached to the idea of this message about God bringing prodigals home. My message is the greatest love story ever told. Our text will be the 15th chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. As you turn to your Bible or smartphone, my, my wife's got her old, her ancient Bible. And um, we'll be reading from, before we do, let me share something humorous. A couple was known in their town as having a great marriage. And people awful, often honored them and celebrated them. Well, the newspaper wanted to do an a, a article about them, how they stayed happy and joyous for 50 years of marriage. And the reporter said, well, give me the key. What's the secret to a happy marriage for 50 years? And the husband piped right up. He said, well, it began on our honeymoon when we were taking a trip down, a mule ride down the Grand Canyon. And after a little bit, my wife's mule stumbled. And she quietly said, that's one. And it went maybe a half an hour later, her mule stumbled again. And she said, that's two. About a half an hour later, the mule stumbled for the third time. She said, that's three. She opened up her purse, took out a pistol, and shot it dead. <laughs> I screamed in horror. And I said, how could you kill that innocent animal? That's terrible. She quietly looked at me and said, that's one. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, <laughs> verse 1. Then all the, I think that's in the Bible somewhere. <laughs> all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him. But the Pharisees, scribes, complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And Jesus spoke a parable. He spoke back to back three incredible parables that are contained in this chapter. We will begin in the third parable in verse 11. And Jesus said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And the father divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. When he had spent all, there arose a famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen in that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to, and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now the older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard the music and the dancing, and he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And the servant said, Your brother has come home, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out to him and pleaded with him. 
And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have served you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted, fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the living grace, the heavenly touch on your word. As it floods into our minds, our souls, our spirit, it builds our faith, it renews our mind, it changes our life. I know your servant, your word, and your people. Have your way in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite, this is my favorite parable. And I just love that the heart of God was just opened up for us to see with specific clarity about how God feels about lost people. My first point is this. The lost sheep, there's two parables before that. The lost sheep didn't lose its identity and value even when it was in the wrong place. The lost coin didn't lose its identity and value even when it was in the wrong place. The lost son didn't lose his identity and value even when he was in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. It begins in this chapter, the shepherd has 100 sheep, one goes missing, and the shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one. And he searches and he finds the sheep, puts it on his shoulder, brings it home, and tells his friends, come and celebrate with me. I have found the lost sheep. And then Jesus said, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous. And then Jesus said, a woman had ten coins, she lost one. She swept and cleaned her house, house diligently until she found the coin, then celebrated what she had found. And Jesus said again, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner than that repents. And the same joy now is de declared in specific relational a, a narrative of a father and son, something we can relate with as human beings. There were only two kinds of people in the story and two kinds of people in this world. Those that are in the father's house and those who are trying to make their way back to the father's house. People don't lose their value to God even when they're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Ah, Romans 5 says this about our salvation, reminding us of what it took for Christ to come and what it means for us. Romans 5 verse 6 says this, When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. That's everybody. And scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we had no apparent value in the New Testament, the, the New Testament is written in Greek and Aramaic. The, the Greek language is a language of science, giving birth to Latin. These, these great languages, in the Greek language, you can create a word to describe a meaning, to create a meaning. So when you want to describe something, you form a compound word and you can really accurately describe something. In the English language, we have one word for love. And it could have me to a hundred different things, you know. I love chocolate. Well, I love beautiful Mary more than I love chocolate. You know what I'm saying? They're not really com comparable. But in the Greek language, you have these four words and, and for love. One is philios. It means friendship, brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia city of brotherly love. Stereo is a family love that is innate in a bloodline because parents for children, children for parents, that kind of love. Eros is sexual love. And when Jesus came on this scene, he brought a word that's not in 
the manuscripts of history. We can't find it in any literature before Christ. So it's either a word Christ invented, created, or adopted an unused word called agape. And so Jesus brought this word agape. And agape means this, this one-sided, this unilateral love. God loves you whether you love him back or not. And the real idea of agape means when a person sees an object or person and finds so much beauty and value in that object or person, they feel compelled to love it. So it's a love that sees value and sees beauty and responds with love. God so loved the world, saw beauty and value in a broken, sinful, rebellious, fallen world. God saw value and beauty when it wasn't apparent. It's amazing how God can help us see in the world around us value in people, even when they are not presently displaying it. A couple of points about this parable. When, when our lives are not lived Christ-centered, there's always a waste attached to it. Any life that's not lived for God is wasted. It doesn't matter how much success you have. If that success was absent Jesus, it's really failure. There's nothing you can do to make God stop loving you. No matter how far you run, love will chase you down. He will never give up on you. In this parable we have the, the concept of what sin does, the seduction of sin. Sin seduces us with pleasure for a season, but punishes us with pain for a lifetime. Everything's good. The party's going on. The money is flowing. The friends are gathered. But eventually, the punishment came. And he ended up having to serve something he despised. Two Jews working at a pig farm would be a horrific thing because pigs were unclean. And so he's in the worst possible thing. That's what the enemy does to people. God doesn't give up on people or throw them away, even if they've wasted their lives on sinful living. I had a lesson early on in our ministry, and um, someone had disappointed us, and they walked away from Christ in the church, and, and I got upset with them because it kind of hurt my wife, the situation. And about a year into it, the Lord just Sunday at the church said, this, this rebuke to me. Michael Maiden, you give up on people too easily. Wow. And he said, I never give up. Yeah. And he said to me, as long as they're alive, there's hope for their life. And I dropped to my knees and I started praying for this person. And back then in ancient times, we had these devices on our kitchen walls called telephones. <laughs> and it rang and I answered it. It was this person coming back to God and coming back into our lives. And it was a life lesson to me about the patience, the long-suffering, yeah. and the eternal mercy of our God. God doesn't give up on people. Amen. There's something, a beautiful story when Christ was crucified. And crucifixion is not just a death sentence. It's a horrible suffering. It's really torture. So there's all kinds of agony. It was the Romans specialized in torturing people to death. So he's being tortured, so he's in an unspeakable agony, let alone the sin of the world being put on him, on him. Lots of stuff happening in the cross. And while Christ is in all that agony, he wins someone to heaven. Yes. Next to him, on the right and left, are two thieves. Right. One of the thieves is mocking and dying in anger and bitterness. The other thief rebukes him and said, we're getting what we deserve, but this guy didn't deserve this. And he said, please remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now think about this. Maybe that thief had lived his entire life in criminal behavior. Maybe he was the worst of the worst. Yet, in the last five minutes of his life, grace undid a lifetime of sin. And if God, listen, you've got to get this. 
You're going to be shocked about who makes it to heaven. There are so many Christians now that are making heaven uh, because as soon as you get mad at someone or someone has a disagreement, you think they're not going to make it in. But you might be surprised who makes it in. Because that thief said, Jesus, help me. I honor you. In this parable also is the idea that everything in the world eventually evaporates and runs out. The world is the place of constant famine, of lack. But there's never a famine in the Father's house. There's never a famine. The world runs out of joy, peace, and love, grace, life, healing. At the, at the Father's house, in the kingdom of God, to Jesus, there's never a famine. Okay. There's enough power in the name of Jesus to heal every sick person on this planet. There's enough grace in the blood of Jesus to forgive every sin on this planet. So our God, by His grace, in His kingdom, has made provision. Okay, most people will leave you when you have nothing left to give them. But when people leave, Jesus stays. You find out true friends when you really don't have much to offer them. When they stay with you in those seasons, it's a revelation. Point number two. The Bible says in Christ revealed, when he came to himself, he's in the pig farm. Sometimes it's a common trait in human behavior that sometimes we got to go low before we can find Christ. That's not true for everyone. But it was true in this story and it's often true in life. Conviction is the voice of the Holy Spirit in our conscience drawing us back into the Father's loving arms. Man, I'm so grateful for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So he had in this moment, he came to himself, and that's the consequence of the Holy Spirit bringing a clarity of insight to conviction of heart. Condemnation on the other side is the lie of the enemy driving us away from our God and drowning our souls in shame and guilt. The devil condemns, the Holy Spirit convicts. Jesus said in John 15, when the Holy Spirit, when the Comforter comes, he will convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because we need a Savior, of righteousness, that's our identity, of judgment because the devil's defeated. No one will ever be born again without conviction from the Holy Spirit. So when, when people, because when people evaluate their lives, um, they, they think, well, I'm a pretty good person. You know, overall, morally, you know, pretty well. They, they, they grade their self. But the Bible, the Bible gives us all flunking grades when it comes to moral perfection. Here's what the Bible says. There's none righteous. Not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our need for a Savior. Our need to have our sins remitted and removed. That is wonderful. As believers, it's always good to feel bad about sin. Come on. The longer you walk with Christ, the quicker you repent. The Holy Spirit says you shouldn't have done it. Oh, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. Forgive me. He helps us stay right with God by convicting us when we've stepped out of that righteous behavior. It's good. Amen? Listen, I'm at the point in my life when the Holy Spirit will stop me mid-sentence. If I'm talking about someone, I, I, I never do that. You can ask my wife. Gossip, whatever. If I'm saying something inappropriate, I'll, just, I'll stop and I'll apologize. You know what? I shouldn't have said that. You didn't even finish. I know, but I shouldn't have started. I feel conviction 
The Holy Spirit trusts me with words because I control what comes out of my mouth. And, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit will help us. Come on, the most common way we sin is by thought and word. Okay? And it, the Holy Spirit helps us in both those arenas. It is a common colloquial, it's a common Christian expression that God hates sin but loves sinners. And there's, there's really truth in that. That, that Christ came to rescue us from the plight of sin. But I'd like to say it like this. God hates sin because of the devastation and destruction it brings to the children he loves. Because if you don't get this right, you'll think God hates you because there's sin in you. Come on. The church all the time messes that up. And we point our finger at the culture when people are especially if they're in physical, fleshly, moral, or sexual sin, the easiest step to point out, ah, look at those wicked people. God loves people even when they're abusing their bodies. Thank you, sister. God loves people even when they're deceived about their identity and behaving morally inappropriately. We better get this down. Amen. Lift, lift up a righteous standard. But, but it's so important that we love sinners and don't misrepresent Christ. Because we keep telling, it's like we keep telling the fish, clean yourself. No, you got to catch them. Then, then you clean them. Just bring people to Jesus. People all the time. Pastor, I got this note a couple years ago right here. Pastor, I don't want to uh, bother you. But one of your ushers, right after the offering, went out in the park and, let, and smoked a cigarette <laughs> on the holy grounds of your property. <laughs> and I'm like, at least it wasn't a joint. <laughs> you know, we're making progress. And, but, but, but here's my thing. How do you think that person's going to get set free? We don't have a sign that says, no cigarette smokers allowed. No, come. Cigarette smoking will not send you to hell. It will send you earlier to heaven. <laughs> but it won't, it won't send you to hell. Now, G Jesus loved sinners. Okay, in uh, most people, this is a, a truism, I believe. Most people that are always hypercritical of other people are really under deep conviction from the Holy Spirit. So it is a, it is a human trait that we project on people what we're wrestling with internal, internally. It's very, very common. But when people are kind of hyper and really hateful in their criticism, it's almost always that they're running from something in their own life. And that conviction is being misplaced by a criticism in your life. So, so we have to watch ourselves. Last point. It is the goodness of God. Come on, it's my favorite point. The goodness of God. That leads us to repentance. In the pig field, starving, coveting pig food, he's so hungry. He came to himself. He said, I will arise because my dad's a good man. His servants live good. And he came home not just because he was hungry. He came home because his father was so good. Oh, let's make sure we don't diminish the goodness of God, of God in the eyes of sinners. Amen? Yes. Romans 2 says this, or you who despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. 
David said, taste and see, the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Be the reason someone believes in the goodness of God. Amen. Jesus said in John 3, 16 and 17, God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever, ooh, whosoever, thieves on crosses, people with immoral backgrounds, come on, stay with me, backslidden preachers, crooked lawyers, I know there's none here, crooked lawyers. People, let, let, let me go deeper. Satan that switches warlocks, pornographers, not just drug addicts, drug pushers. This promiscuous love doesn't deny anyone who comes. It says, come, we'll fix you up. We'll clean you up. Just come. Amen. That whosoever will believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. <laughs> but that through him the world might be saved. All through the book of Psalms and the entirety of the Bible, a theme is represented about the nature of God. Our God is full of compassion. The Bible says in this story, to stay with me a couple more minutes, that the father was looking for the son when he saw him. The, the first instinct that erupted in the father's heart when he saw his wayward, broken, disheveled son shuffling home was compassion. And the father had compassion and ran into the arms of his Broken, sinful son. David said this, but God being full of compassion forgave their sin. Psalm 86 says, but you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion. Psalm 111, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 145, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercies. Lamentation 3 says, through the Lord's, though the Lord's mercies are our, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. In the New Testament I had so much fun with this. Matthew years ago I just wanted to look up every time the word compassion was used in the life of Christ. And I found these seven unique and distinct moments when the Bible says this phrase, he was moved with compassion. He opened the blind man's eyes, moved with compassion. Healed the leper, moved with compassion. Raised the dead boy for the widow of Nain, moved with compassion. Fed the 5,000, moved with compassion. It seemed like he went from place to place, but, but his journey was often interrupted by love encounters. When his radar pulled him into the life of a broken person, and whenever compassion led him to a place, there was always a miraculous result as a consequence of that love. It wasn't that he patted a broken person on the head and said, I'm sorry, you're going. He changed their life. Yes. Follow where love leads you because it will lead you into miracles. Yes. Uh, thank you, God, for your compassion for us. We are never more like Jesus than when we love people. God knows everything about you, my friend, and still is madly in love with you. There's nothing you could do to make him stop loving you. Sin turns sons and daughters into slaves and orphans. The father did four things. I'm going to sort of race through this, almost done. The father, the, the, the son in the arms of his father, his father kissing him over and over. The kisses of, of love, forgiveness, acceptance. And the, the, the son said, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me a servant. And the father ignored it. Why? It wasn't true. Every time you talk to God with diminished phraseology about your identity, he, he don't listen. Yeah. It might be therapy for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
he turned to his servant and said, go back home and get the best robe out of the closet. Because we're going to take that filthy rag and put the house garment on him. Listen, the moment you came to Christ, you got a new identity. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Rhonda said it so, to us so beautiful. Old things passed away, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, the Father, the Son, to the Son, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you came to Christ, you got a new identity. You're a child of God. You're a son of God, a daughter of God. You're the righteousness of God. You're more than a conqueror. You are greatly loved. That's not at war against you. The second thing he said, go get the family ring. Back then rings were signet rings with large circles on them and they represented signatures. They were used for signatures for all legal and financial dealings. What would it be like today if someone walked up to you and gave you a unlimited credit card? You wouldn't be home for four days. <laughs> Got some business to do. We have, okay, Jesus said, I'm going, take my name. I'm going, I give you my name. Here's what he said. If you ask anything in my name, the Father will do it. When you pray for the sick in my name, the sickness hears it as if I was standing there myself. Amen. We've been given authority in Jesus. And at the Father's house, our authority in the kingdom is restored. The third thing, new sandals, speaks of destiny, purpose, and life. God's calling for you. And God, your identity awakens your destiny. And God heals our hearts so they can dream again. God made your heart to be a dream factory. And you know your heart's healthy when it dreams again. And God wants you to dream about the life you were born for. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the thoughts that I think about you, says the Lord. Th not evil ones, good ones. They give you a future and a hope. The last thing the father said, go kill the fatty calf. Because we're going to celebrate our, this son. God always has provision in a stable waiting for you to enter into your purpose. And when you walk into your purpose, he opens the stable and brings out his provision. That's what God has at the Father's house. Last idea. The older brother, the story could have ended. It was beautiful. But there's this other dude. The older brother goes to church every week, lives morally, serves his family, living a good life. Here's a ruckus coming toward the house, asked someone, what does this mean? Your brother's home, and your father's throwing a party. And instead of celebrating with his father, he is angry. All of us are tempted five minutes after being saved to become Pharisees. <laughs> Talking about smokers, you know who smokers bother the worst? The people that quit smoking six days ago. The great tragedy of the older brother was that even though he stayed at his father's house, he did not share his father's heart. When this church stops caring for the lost, we stop sharing the heart of the father. Personal holiness is wonderful and even necessary if we want to be like Jesus. But we should never use our own holiness as a weapon to assault people who are struggling or, or who have fallen into sin. The father said, how can you live here and not know me? All that I have is yours. The older brother could have had everything his father gave the younger son. His life was limited, unfulfilled, and unhappy because he never knew the heart of his father and the privileges that were already his at the father's house. The most miserable person you'll ever meet are those people who try to earn by their behavior what God has already freely given them by grace. You can't love someone until you stop judging them. Stop asking God to judge and destroy the very people he sent his son to save and heal. Oh, the older brother. We've all been older brothers. Come on. Come on. 
Be honest. Someone gets up their testimony. Oh, man, that's what I'm going to testify. My business is taking off. I got a brand new Cadillac. You know they're saved, but just barely. You look at their life thing. what in the heck? How come they got all that happening? We have to watch that we don't become critical of the good thing God does in someone else because it hasn't happened in us yet. Oh, if you're single, wave your hand like you don't care. Okay, wait a minute. So, love, uh, half our church single, love all of you. Mary and I are trying to model a good marriage. Still working on it. I've loved her 44 years. She's my Valentine, 44 years. <clears throat> we were both in kindergarten. No, we, we were 19. She was my dad who was here with the cowboy hat, sharp, handsome man, 83-year-old father. She was my dad's secretary. And I stole her from my, the church. <laughs> but listen to me. It's hard when you've been believing for the right person and you've got this beautiful couple and you have to get to the place where you can be so happy for them. Yeah. Even before this happened for you. Yeah. When God sees us happy, for what he's done for someone else. He can't wait to do the same thing for us. Now, I, the father's heart is so beautiful. He comes out. This boy needed a good slapping. But the father came out and pleaded with him to come in. God loves people even people that have religious spirits. Amen. Even people that are hypercritical. God loves them. And we want to make sure that we don't put people in all these categories so we can judge them. That's right. I'm closing with this thought. I believe a great revival of prodigals coming home is about to begin. And I want to encourage you, Isaiah 64 says, lift up your eyes and see your sons and daughters from faraway places. In the Babylonian captivity, they separated families. They, they made Israel slaves and they broke up families. And God said, I don't care what broke up your family, I can heal it. Amen. And he said, here's what God said, if you can see it by faith, I can do it. Amen. In this season... Reclaim your faith for the salvation of every unsaved and backslidden family member in your world. Amen. And believe and confess and declare it. I was, someone showed me first service, <clears throat> a text that, that she had just gotten. So I'm doing this sermon, she just got a text from her son who's away from God saying, Mom, I had a dream about getting right with God. I had a dream. God knows how to reach our kids. Yeah. Even when they've stopped listening to them. It's not your preaching that's going to win them. It's your prayers that will defeat the enemy and bring them home. Yeah, if they'll listen, preach to them. But God's going to do something so amazing. I was in Fullerton, California last year. The great church there. And um, I was praying, had a prophetic word for this lovely Hispanic woman. And I said, your son, your son, your son, God's after your son. And even though he's been in addiction for, I don't know, 19, 20 years, whatever it was, God says, this is the year for deliverance in your home. And so I went on, I'm really digging into this prayer with this woman, Freedom House Church. While I'm praying for her, the back door opens to the church, and a man starts walking down the aisle. It's the first time in church, it was her son. And so, before I finished the prophecy, the prophecy was standing next to her. God. Now, here's my point. God can't wait to do what you're praying for him to do. 
And we must passionately participate and partner with God and walk around our homes and say, every time the de devil reminds you of what they're doing wrong, start prophesying to the devil of what they're going to do right. Come on. Turn it around. I'm all done. Thank you for listening to me. I want to close with this prayer. If you would stand to your feet. Here's what I want to do just for 90 seconds. Let's just spend a moment praying for every person in the orbit of our lives, family or friends, that's away from God. And the Holy Spirit will give you names and remind you of people, people He so loves to pray for. But let's pray right now just for a minute and a half. Father, we lift up our sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, moms and dads, nieces and nephews. We lift up our friends. Come on, just say their name out loud. Father, we claim their salvation. We claim the dream, the destiny, the purpose that they were born for. We pray for every chain of darkness and deception to be broken off their hearts. Let them know how loved they are. Let the pain or trauma that's driven them to certain behaviors be healed. We claim them, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And we see by faith they're coming back. They're coming back. Yes. There are millions of prodigals in America. Yes. There are hundreds of thousands of them just in Maricopa Valley, Maricopa County. And we're gonna, we're gonna watch God do such a great work. People that the devil thinks he's won are about to be ripped out of the arms of hellish oppression and brought back to Jesus.